but it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can you all hear me uh, adequately? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, uh, I thought, uh, I guess, I'll, I'll go right to the questions that you uh, framed the debate with. The question is, this a moment of opportunity? Uh, first of all, I'd have to say I'd be kind of a fool to be setting up and running INET if I didn't think so. So uh, <laughs> I guess, how would I say, there's revealed preference in that one. Uh, do I think this is a moment of opportunity? I remember years ago seeing Jürgen Habermas give a speech, and he talked about how elites behave, how power behaves, and he said they will legitimate if they can, the worse if they have to, and accommodate if they must. <laughs> and my sense is that this is a tremendous moment of opportunity, and joining an event like this with so many smart, well-educated, well-intentioned people who are very clear in each of your presentations that this is not a legitimate system that traditional economic uh, theory or economic perspective looks for. I, do, I think the legitimacy of this system is, is, is shattered. Uh, and at some level, I guess then we have to worry about what are the constituent energies of reform and uh, whether coercive behavior, which is always uh, disheartening, uh, would play a role, or whether we can inspire accommodation. Uh, with regard to what do I think is wrong and what constitutes the, the basis of a life-serving paradigm, I begin with uh, what I think is the biggest flaw in economics, and I think we are all contributing to it. And that is the yearning for false certainty. Uh, when we talk about a life-serving paradigm, we act like, just even in the language we choose, there is something out there that can be accomplished and grasped that we will then all, which you might call, de-link from this and link to that, and then, it, and then we'll all feel better. Uh, my sense is that knowledge is always imperfect, and we're always if you will, sailing in the fog, and it's an anxious process. And we have to resist the temptation continuously to uh, the state, substitute false certainty for the, the humility of, of inquiry. And, and it's, it's very daunting. It also, uh, unfortunately, at times of the greatest uncertainty and disorder, produces the greatest yearning for demagogues to fill that void, which is, uh, is quite dangerous. But I think the, the, each of you have articulated a great deal of what I would call a life-serving paradigm. It's, it's essentially envisioning the goals and deriving the goals from the kind of things that produce healthy, and, and I mean healthy not only in the physical sense, but mentally healthy human beings. And I think there's an awful lot in medicine and epidemiology and psychology that can give us some guiding light. When it comes to ecological economics and the question of what might have gone wrong or is going wrong, my sense is that pointing out the ecological uh, dangers is something that's going right, but not understanding that there are more emotions at play than just which you might call the end gate damage of destroying the environment. Uh, understanding the resistance of well-meaning people to change, the idea that I'm going to lose my job in the name of making this a better system would probably be daunting and frightening to a large number of people. And we're existing in a time where our uh, macroeconomic ideologies are producing substantial and broad-based underemployment all over the world, and the idea that people who have jobs are willing to change for the long run with it is perhaps uh, a, a slightly romantic specification of the <laughs> challenges that we face in inspiring uh, a move and evolution. Uh, I'd like to some of what, uh, in the dialogue that preceded this through email, gave us some of the things that you talked about uh, that are very formidable parts of the challenge of producing 
uh, which you might call a new way of seeing or looking at, at these things. And in particular, one looks at the structure of the economics profession. We look at the, which you might call frozen or antiseptic ways in which human beings were treated or modeled. We look at the false certainty embodied in all of these mathematical systems, which imply that these are stable functional forms, and then you, you bring in the human dimension so nicely that people whose skill set, some of it God-given, some of it cultivated, are, are the people who like to stay within that anesthetic framework. That's where their, which you might call, their sense of confidence is, is fortified, staying in that simplistic, uh, and not always simplistic, sometimes very complex mathematical. And, and I think the, uh, the challenge to the profession is going to have to come from the outside. So as it's, if you will, the people who are economists practicing that toxic and antiseptic mode are going to be further and further marginalized, ridiculed, and bypassed. And so, which you might say, the tribal anthropology will break down over time. And, my own intuition is that we, by granting at that profession, are actually fortifying the resolve by having the fear and allowing that tribe to circle the wagons. And uh, I always think this in the structure of argument, uh, they talk about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I really think, or Joseph Schumpeter used to say, you don't beat a theory with a critique, you beat a theory with a different theory. Well, I'll, I'll change it a little bit. You beat a, theory, you beat a vision, you beat a bad vision with a better vision. And I think we need to be in the business of creating affirmative visions, and all of us need to be very attentive to emotions. We are not in a Darwinistic pro process where the best ideas win out self-evidently. We're in an emotional process where bad ideas that are gratified are often much more resilient than they should be. And we have to learn how to unlock emotions and help human beings evolve. I'll finish with my, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite writers, Antoine saint Super. probably all know, wrote The Little Prince. And he often said, it is only with the heart that one can truly see. So I think the, uh, how do I say it? The reinjection of the heart to challenge the enlightenment to frozen mind is a very important dimension of this. And another great author, Helen Luke, once wrote an essay where she talked about the laughter at the heart of things. I think we need a little more sense of humor in order to inspire those people to come out of their foxholes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Rob. That's that's great.